It was the summer of 1972 when my dad first told me we were going to Alaska. I was 15 at the time. Like most kids, the idea of traveling somewhere new and far away sounded adventurous. But the way my dad described it, this wouldn't be just a vacation. He said we were going to live off the land for two whole months. No grocery stores, no hotels, no modern comforts. Just the two of us surviving in the wild, using only our wits and wilderness skills. Dad had always been into stuff like that. He grew up in rural Montana, and I guess that frontier spirit just lived deep in his bones. He was ex-military too, and did two tours in Vietnam during the late 60s. I think those years of training as a soldier and living in the jungle made regular civilian life too tame for him. He was always watching shows about exotic places and outdoor survival. He'd go on weekend camping trips in the California wilderness near our home, seeing how long he could go with barely any supplies. I think deep down my dad wished he'd been born a hundred years earlier, when men had to hunt and track and battle the elements just to stay alive. So when he said we were going to spend our summer camping in the Alaskan interior, miles from any signs of people, I wasn't that surprised. I didn't know much about Alaska back then, except that it was America's last frontier. The few TV shows and movies set there made it seem like this great frozen wasteland populated by burly men panning for gold, hunting bears, and dodging avalanches. I imagined we'd be fishing through holes in the ice and sleeping in igloos to stay warm at night. I only learned later that the area we'd be going to was actually dense forest and rugged mountain country, with plentiful wildlife roaming below the treetops. I tried to be excited about the trip as the weeks counted down. My dad pored over his maps of Alaska, planning out where he thought would be the perfect spot to make our base camp, somewhere along the Yukon River Basin far from any trails or roads. He stocked up on basic camping gear, tents, sleeping bags, tools for building shelters and fire. And he made special trips to the Army Surplus Store to buy dehydrated rations, snares, and traps even an old rifle in case we encountered any bears or aggressive wildlife. My mom wasn't thrilled about me being gone all summer, but I could tell Dad was set on this. He said it would make me grow up strong and self-reliant, not some soft suburban kid. I knew better than to argue with him when his mind was made up. The night before we left, I barely slept thinking about what lay in store during those two months. Would I make my dad proud and become a rugged outdoorsman? Or would I crack under the pressure and have to be rescued like some wimp? Only one way to find out, I guess. We took a train up the west coast to Seattle first. That alone was an adventure since I'd never been that far from home. From Seattle we caught a prop plane to Anchorage, flying over snow-capped peaks that stabbed at the sky for hours. Then it was on to a little bush plane that took us out to a remote gravel airfield somewhere deep in the Alaskan brush. A weather-beaten local with a pickup truck took us the last few miles to a tiny village consisting of a trading post, saloon, and a few log homes. I remember standing on that dusty road looking all around at the majestic wilderness that encircled us. The warm June air was filled with the scent of pine and the sounds of unknown animals stirring in the distance. This was it. The small bush plane drops us off on a long stretch of gravel that can barely pass as a runway. It's the last sign of civilization we'll see for the next two months. Surrounded by rugged wilderness, Dad and I shoulder our heavy packs, stuffed with camping gear, and start hiking into the dense forest. We're navigating using Dad's homemade map, following what appears to be an old animal trail. It's slow going picking our way through brush and thickets, up and down rocky slopes. Sweat drips into my eyes as I struggle to match Dad's pace. He's loving this, taking deep breaths of the fresh air, pointing out wildflowers, and stopping to inspect animal tracks in the mud. I'm just trying not to twist an ankle or get my pack snagged on branches. We hike for hours, the trail winding higher into forested foothills. Exhaustion weighs on me, but Dad presses on enthusiastically until we reach a clearing along a rushing river. This looks like a prime spot, he declares, dropping his pack. I shrug mine off gratefully, gulping water from the stream. 
we take a short break to recover before setting up camp. Following Dad's instructions, I gather fallen logs to make a shelter while he assembles the tents and builds a fire pit. By the time we finish, it's nearly sunset. We wolf down some beans and rice for dinner, watching the last light fade behind the jagged mountains that surround us. I'm dead on my feet, but Dad seems energized being out in the wilderness. As I drift off in the tent, he stays up gazing at the dazzling night sky. The next morning, Dad is raring to go. Time for Wilderness Survival 101, he says with an eager grin. He showed me how to set snares and fishing lines, prep game, tan hides, and filter water. I try my best to absorb it all, though my city kid hands fumble with the knots and traps. Dad also gives me lessons in foraging, tracking game, reading the weather, and how to avoid bears. But it's clear from his animated lectures that he's in his element while I feel totally out of mine. I grow more discouraged as the days pass in a blur of grueling work, hauling wood, smoking meat, mending torn clothes and gear. My body aches from the endless tasks, fingers are calloused and blistered. Dad insists it's making me into a man. But cold, hungry, bone-tired, I feel more like a lost little boy. Still, I persevere, not wanting to let Dad down. One morning we wake to find our cache of smoked salmon ravaged, with giant paw prints surrounding the shredded remains. Must have been a grizzly, Dad surmises. Despite his calm tone, I see the concern in his eyes that some massive creature has found our camp. We double down on precautions, suspending our food packs high in the trees where nothing can reach them. A week later, the intruder returns. I know as soon as I poke my head out of the tent and spot Dad cursing at the sight of our ransacked food bags and cooler lying in a heap, contents scattered. His face is furious as he examines the huge, vaguely human-like prints. I'm paralyzed with fear, thinking some savage beast is roaming just beyond the tree line, watching us. Dad squeezes my shoulder, telling me not to worry, he'll protect us. But his jaw stays clenched tightly all day as he paces around camp. That night, I had trouble sleeping, imagining the creature lurking in the darkness, waiting to strike again. Some primal sense tells me it's not just a bear. As exhaustion finally sets in near dawn, I hear Dad quietly cleaning his rifle outside the tent. The next morning, I woke up feeling groggy and chilled to the bone. I'm shocked to see sunlight filtering through the vinyl tent roof. Dad should have woken me hours ago. I scramble out, yelling for him. He's nowhere to be seen. The camp is eerily silent. I search every inch but find only his rifle leaning against a tree. My heart sank, realizing I was now alone and something terrible clearly happened while I slept. Dad! I shout desperately into the forest until my voice cracks. No answer. Then I see them. The monstrous footprints surrounding my tent, far bigger than a man's. My heart is pounding as I sprint blindly between the trees, calling for Dad. It's been two days since he mysteriously vanished from our camp, and I know I have to act fast if I have any hope of finding him alive. So despite having no trail to follow and no survival skills, I plunge recklessly into the sprawling Alaskan forest. Low-hanging branches whip my face and arms as I crash through the underbrush. I keep shouting, Dad, can you hear me? But the woods swallow my voice. I slow to catch my breath, hands shaking with adrenaline and fear. Get it together, I tell myself. Freaking out won't save Dad. I force myself to stop and listen. Maybe he's yelling for help somewhere nearby. But all I hear is the wind rattling branches. Think. I try to remember any tracking tips Dad taught me. Look for broken twigs, disturbed soil, anything that seems out of place. I scan the ground, desperate for a sign he passed this way. At first, I saw nothing but leaf litter and fungi. But then, I spot a faint boot print in a muddy patch. It's headed downstream towards a small creek. Hope rising, I hurry to follow the trail. More prints appear periodically along the creek's mossy banks. 
My pace quickens, and I watch intently for any other clues. Crossing the icy creek makes the trail disappear momentarily. But then I see a scrap of Dad's red flannel shirt snagged on a fallen log. I must be getting close. Hold on, Dad! I'm coming! I yell, my voice echoing off the rocks. I'm halfway up the side of a ravine now, following the creek higher into the hills. My thighs burn, and I slip often on the damp leaves, but I can't slow down. I have to find Dad today, or else... I shake off that thought and call his name again. Maybe this time he'll answer, but only the shriek of a hawk replies. I keep climbing until I reach a tumbling waterfall spilling into a clear pool. Spray mists my face as I stop to scan the area, hands cupped around my mouth. Can you hear me? Dad! Why won't he respond? Is he... No. He has to be okay. But the trail seems to disappear by the waterfall. I desperately look around for where to go next. Then I notice a rocky outcrop jutting above the pool. Is that... a handprint? Edge out along the outcrop to examine it. Yes, a muddy handprint. Dad's for sure. He must have climbed up this ledge. With renewed motivation, I inch around the falls and up the slick rocks. Don't look down, I tell myself, focusing on any potential handholds. I reach a small plateau finally where I can rest a minute. No more signs of Dad, but I must be gaining on him. Catching my breath, I gaze across the ravine to the opposite ridge. Something catches my eye near the tree line. Is that... Dad waving his arms? I see you! I yell excitedly. But he doesn't react, just keeps waving erratically. I shade my eyes, studying this strange movement. Is that even a person? Or some swaying branches and a false hope? Cold disappointment washes over me. It must be a trick of the light and shadow. My mind playing cruel jokes on me. Despair overwhelms me, and I realize I've lost the trail and wasted precious time chasing mirages. Hot tears roll down my cheeks. I just want to curl up on the rocks and give up. But I can't let Dad down. He'd keep searching relentlessly if it were me lost out here. Wiping my eyes, I resolve to keep going even though I'm reaching my physical limits. I manage to inch my way back around the falls and continue downstream, looking for any subtle signs of passage. The day is fading, but I won't let darkness stop this search. I just hope I'm going in the right direction. My range of vision narrows as the sun sinks below the ridgeline. I keep my eyes glued to the ground, terrified of missing some vital clue in the growing gloom. Will Dad survive another frigid night out here alone? I'm so focused on searching for tracks that I don't see the fallen log spanning the creek up ahead. My shin cracks against it painfully, sending me sprawling into the icy water. The current tugs at my clothes as I struggle to stand. Jagged rocks slice my hands as I crawl back to shore. Exhausted, I collapse on the muddy bank. Through chattering teeth, I scan the darkening woods, praying Dad will suddenly emerge. But I know that's just a fantasy. He's still lost out there, and now so am I. And I'm in no shape to keep going. Utterly defeated, I drag myself back up the trail using trees for support. My soaked clothes cling coldly as night falls and temperatures drop. I keep blacking out and stumbling, but finally... I make out the faint glow of our campfire through the trees. Somehow I manage to wander in a giant circle today. Dad is still nowhere to be found. I sink down by the flames, every fiber of me screaming in pain and sorrow. But I can't give up. At dawn's first light, I'll search again. The warmth from the crackling flames slowly revives my battered body. As I sit there wrapped in a blanket... I methodically clean and dress my many cuts using the first aid kit. Spraining my ankle crossing that creek earlier doesn't help matters, but I just grit my teeth and tightly wrap it with an ace bandage. Once I've patched myself up, I gingerly hobble around camp taking stock of our remaining supplies. The situation isn't promising. Dad's absence means it's all up to me now to provide food, 
mend damaged gear, and maintain the fire. Can I survive solo out here? Doubt and despair creep back in as I survey our meager camp. But moping won't make Dad magically reappear. I shove the fears aside and focus on tasks that might boost my chances. Gathering firewood, preparing some trout I caught earlier, and refilling our water stores. Keeping busy steadies my nerves and boosts my morale a little. But it still feels like I'm just biding time until Dad comes hiking back into view. Please, let it be soon. The fish help strengthen and warm me after that brutal day of hiking. As I gnaw the last fatty morsels off the bone, I think of Dad still out there hungry and shivering. Is he managing to find any food or shelter? Is he... No, can't go down that road. Have to stay positive he's alive. I toss the picked bones into the fire. Sparks dance up towards the stars, which glow brightly in the crisp night sky. Then I hear it. The long, lonely howl of a wolf echoes across the valley. Something about its mournful cry sends a chill down my spine. It's answered by another wolf, closer this time. I instinctively scoot nearer the flames, stoking them with a stick. I know wolves usually avoid humans, but being alone now, I can't help feeling scared. More howls join in all around, making the forest seem to close in on me. Sleep won't come easy tonight. In the morning, I'll search again no matter what. If the wolves find Dad first... No. I can't think about that. He only had a day head start, so he can't be far. As the moon rises overhead, I stare into the swirling flames, imagining they are a campfire keeping Dad warm somewhere out there. Today was another long, difficult day with no sign of Dad. My ankle throbs, my back aches, and my morale is sinking steadily. But I have to keep trying. I hold on to the slim hope that maybe he left clues or signs for me in our traps. As I check each empty trap along the trail, my heart sinks more. Then I arrive at the final snare near the creek and see the rabbit I caught yesterday is gone. The hope flickers back to life. Dad must have taken it to survive another day. He had to be here. My eyes scour the area, looking for any other evidence he passed by. I'm on the right track, I yell out excitedly. Just hang on, Dad. I'm going to find you. I gather the scattered branches of the disassembled trap, wanting to be methodical and not miss anything. As I'm rebuilding it, I notice some scratched marks on a tree trunk. I rush over to inspect them. Is it... A message from Dad? I run my fingers over the rough letters carved into the bark that spell D, A, uh, D. Yes, it has to be sign left for me. My heart swells, knowing I'm on the right path. I just have to keep following it along the creek. The morning sun filters through the trees as I stir awake, my body stiff and sore from another night sleeping on the hard ground. As I poke at the dying campfire and begin boiling water for my morning tea, a thin tendril of smoke on the distant ridge catches my eye. I freeze, kettle in hand, and stare at the gray smoke wisping above the treetops. There's no mistaking it for a natural forest fire with the way it billows in contained puffs, as if someone is sending a smoke signal. But who could be out here signaling in the remote wilderness besides Dad? My heart leaps. It has to be him. Hands shaking with adrenaline, I scramble to pack up a small day bag with some supplies. I douse the fire and slop some more tea into my thermos before hurriedly setting out toward the smoke. As I crash through the underbrush, I shout anxiously, Don't worry, Dad, I'm coming. The smoke looks several miles away across rugged terrain, but I'm determined to reach it as fast as possible. I clamber up steep, wooded slopes, then cautiously pick my way down loose shale on the other side. Heavy branches whip across my face as I force my way through thickets choked with alder and devil's club. I slip often on the damp tundra, but keep staggering onward. That column of smoke is my only tether of hope that Dad is still alive out here somewhere. 
As the day wears on, however, the smoke starts dissipating against the dreary gray sky. I panic, quickening my aching pace as much as possible. But by the time I reach the ridge where it originated, there's nothing left but a faint whiff of burnt wood. No, no, no! I cry in anguish, frantically searching the area for any other sign of Dad. But the ground shows no footprints, no fresh campfire remains, just flattened grass where perhaps someone was signaling hours ago. Exhausted and heartsick, I collapse to my knees. It's like losing Dad all over again. He must have given up waiting and moved on. And now I've wasted precious daylight chasing smoke through the wilderness. As tears sting my eyes, it really sinks in how utterly alone I am out here. If I don't find Dad soon, I shake off that thought. I can't let hopelessness take root, or I'm as good as dead. I have to keep believing we'll be reunited. Wiping my eyes, I gather my resolve and take one last look around. Maybe Dad left some clue about where he was heading. I notice a faint game trail winding down the backside of the ridge that could be a good starting point tomorrow. But for now, I need to get back to my camp before night falls. The hike back seems to take twice as long, exhausted as I am. I slip often on the damp moss and tangled roots. Too weary to stop again, I sip cold tea and chew jerky as I walk, replaying the morning's disappointment in my head. Where do I search next? Will Dad leave another signal for me? Or will the creature hunting him snuff his life out first? By the time my small campfire comes into view, it's nearly dark. I numbly kick together a fire, too tired for dinner. As I huddle close to the flames, fighting off despair about my vanishing father, the surrounding woods suddenly erupt in chilling howls. Wolves. It's going to be another long, sleepless night. The next morning, I'm shaken awake at sunrise by a horrific scream echoing from somewhere deep in the forest. I lurch up, heart hammering. The anguished screaming goes on and on, then is abruptly silenced. Every hair on my body stands on end. That sounded like a human in mortal agony. Could it be? Dad? What if he's being attacked right now? I grab my knife and scramble from the tent toward the awful sounds. Dad, I'm coming, I shout as I sprint recklessly through the trees with no trail to follow. My mad dash through the forest carries me up a wooded ravine, driven on by adrenaline and terror at what I might discover. As I crest a hill, the trees open up revealing a small clearing nestled between the ridges. I'm met with a gruesome sight that stops me dead in my tracks. A huge pit has been dug in the middle of the clearing, roughly fifteen feet wide. The dirt sides plunge ten feet down to a floor bristling with sharpened wooden stakes and animal bones. It's unmistakably a primitive trap built to capture and kill. Could this be responsible for the agonized screaming I heard earlier? My instincts scream at me to run from this evil place. But I have to know if this is the creature's lair that took Dad. I creep slowly along the pit's grassy edge, peering down apprehensively. The wooden spikes are caked in dried blood. Tufts of torn clothing and fur cling to them as well. And is that a human skull grinning up at me from atop a stake? I stagger back, bile rising in my throat. What kind of sadistic monster are we dealing with? As I stand shaking at the edge of the barbaric trap, the screams echo through my mind again. Maybe Dad stumbled right into this clearing too, and met his end impaled in the pit, crying out his last breaths. At that gruesome thought, my knees nearly gave out. I squeeze my eyes shut, mouthing a silent prayer that isn't how Dad died. Drawing a shaky breath, I force myself to turn away from the pit and keep moving. I have to find him, or what's left of him. Still reeling from the discoveries in the trapline clearing, I scramble back into the trees, just wanting to put distance between me and that horrific pit. As I run, the forest suddenly rings out with more agonized screaming just ahead. Could it be survivors of the pit trap? Or new victims? 
I crash through the underbrush toward the screams. They turn to chilling gurgles that make my skin crawl. Then silence again. I'm getting close now, my own panicked breathing and snapping twigs drowned out only by my pounding heartbeat. Bursting into another small clearing, I gasped at the sight before me. A massive elk lies sprawled on its side, throat torn out and belly gutted. Its glassy eyes stare at nothing. Splashes of blood drench the grass around it. I immediately understood this poor animal's cries were what I heard. It must have escaped an attack only to come die here. But what killed it? I circle the elk warily, taking in the deep slashes in the side of its body. Some creature with huge claws and monstrous strength did this. As I examine the elk's wounds, I feel eyes upon me. I freeze, sensing something lurking just out of sight. Moving slowly, I draw my knife from its sheath. My mind screams at me to run, but I have to know what's here. Is it the creature that took Dad? Come out and face me, I yell into the trees, sounding braver than I feel. In response, a flock of ravens burst from the branches, cawing loudly. I spin toward the commotion, nearly jumping from my skin. But it's just birds taking flight, not the beast, for now at least. It's still out there, hunter and hunted. And it's clear I'm in over my head against this predator. Still wary of whatever killed this deer nearby, I approach it slowly, knife poised to strike. As I reach the elk's body, I spot the massive footprints pressed into the bloody earth around it. I crouch down to inspect one more closely. The track has a vaguely human shape but dwarfs any man's foot, nearly 18 inches long from the heel to toe. The depth and spacing between prints indicate something extremely heavy made them, crunching effortlessly through sticks and underbrush. What primordial nightmare could leave signs this huge? The arctic chill grips my spine again despite the warm day. I follow the tracks a few yards into the bush. They lead to an area of flattened grass where it appears the creature dragged the elk carcass back to feast on it. I dig around in the depressed grass and unearth chunks of loose fur and flesh likely discarded by the beast. I hold my breath against the raw stench. Clearly, I'm dealing with no ordinary animal here. And I'm certain now it's the same creature that raided our camp and stole Dad away. Could he still be alive as its captive somehow? The possibility fuels a tiny shred of hope in me. But how can I possibly rescue him from such a powerful, ruthless monster? As I ponder my bleak chances, a raven lands on the elk carcass and begins tearing greedily at its tongue. I swat it away, which startles nearby crows into a loud, wing-flapping frenzy. Leaving the mutilated elk behind, I press on through the forest following the ominous footprints. They lead me over a gurgling stream and up a mossy embankment. I emerge from the trees into another small clearing littered with the remnants of what was once a campsite. Tattered canvas tent scraps hang from broken poles. Shredded clothes are strewn about, along with some empty cans of beans and boots with the toes ripped out. It looks like someone or some group, had a camp here that met a violent end. Could these scraps belong to past victims of the creature? I rifle through the ruins looking for any clues, but find nothing of use. Everything has been torn apart in apparent rage long ago. As I'm crouched by the long, cold fire pit, something shiny half-buried in the dirt catches my eye. I dig it out. It's a woman's silver locket still smooth despite years of exposure. My thumb brushes away the grime clouding its surface. Engraved on the front are the letters A plus J. Who did this belong to? I fasten the locket around my own neck for safekeeping, saying a quick prayer for its unknown owner, AJ, whose last moments here must have been utterly terrifying. I pick through the camp remains a bit longer, but it seems the only story to glean is one of unimaginable carnage. These poor souls likely crossed paths with the formidable creature, and it did not end well for them. I hope for better fortune finding Dad, if he remains alive to be found.
The creature's tracks weave deeper into the woods beyond the ravaged campsite. With growing dread, I continue following them until the large prints veer off toward a massive old-growth spruce. Beneath its sprawling branches sits the cold remains of another campfire, recently burned out. I approach cautiously, already fearing what I'll find. My heart drops into my stomach when I spot the tattered plaid shirt discarded next to the fire. It's Dad's. He'd been wearing it the morning he disappeared. I pick it up with trembling hands. The back is shredded and caked in dried blood. Collapsing to my knees, I clutch the ruined shirt tightly and bow my head. I came all this way clinging to a thin hope that Dad might still be alive. But this grisly evidence extinguishes that last flicker. He must have stopped here to rest and build a fire, only to be savagely attacked without warning, like all the other hapless people whose paths crossed with this monster. I squeeze my eyes shut, hot tears spilling down my cheeks. Dad is really gone. The jarring reality sinks through me, leaving only numbness behind. What do I do now? Wandering the wilderness solo until the creature comes for me too? The cold indifference of the Alaskan forest threatens to swallow me. But then that numbness turns to hot anger. Dad didn't deserve this horrific fate. No one did. If I can't save him, I can at least avenge him and make sure the beast that killed him harms no one else ever again. I roughly smear the tears from my face and stand, turning to follow the tracks again with renewed, raging purpose. This ends now. Seeing the bloody shreds of Dad's shirt extinguished the last flicker of hope I'd been cradling that he was somehow still alive. Kneeling on the cold ground next to the abandoned campfire, I clutch his ruined shirt tightly in my fists and let the crushing anguish wash over me. No, please God, no, I sob, hot tears spilling down my cheeks. I knew Dad was likely gone the minute I saw his giant footprints leaving our camp. But some irrational part of me still clung to the belief that I'd find him out here somehow, maybe wounded but alive. Now, only his bloodied scraps remain, ripped from his body by unseen claws and teeth. The proof is undeniable. Dad is dead. The beast dragged him from our camp and slaughtered him like prey. I was sleeping just yards away, obliviously dreaming while that monster tore him apart. Blinding guilt mixes with piercing grief. I should have done something, somehow stopped this horrible fate that Dad didn't deserve. He only wanted to bond with me over a camping trip, and it led him to a violent, solitary death so far from home. I yearn to scream my anguish at the indifferent Alaskan sky but I know it will only echo unheard through the endless trees. Dad is gone, and he's never coming back. I'm alone in the wild now, so far over my head against a powerful predator. But as I kneel, rocking back and forth mourning my father, grief slowly morphs into rage, red hot and simmering. I will make this creature pay if it's the last thing I ever do. It brutally killed my father, the only family I had left. Now I have nothing to lose in destroying it or perishing in the attempt. I roughly wipe away my tears, still clutching Dad's tattered shirt in my fist. As the red-hot rage courses through me, eclipsing the anguish, I harden my resolve. This creature will pay dearly for killing my father. I'll make certain of it. No more cowering like prey for me now. I stalk back to the abandoned campsite, and scour the ruins for anything I can use as a weapon. In a torn pack, I find a hatchet with a chipped but still deadly blade. I pick up a bowie knife from the dirt too, and feel the weight of it in my hand. Together with my own hunting knife, I'm armed and ready to hunt the hunter. Near the trampled tents is a battered wooden box with explosives stamped on the side in faded letters. Inside lies coiled fuse wire and sticks of TNT in crumbling paper wrappers. Looks like salvage from the miners who must have camped here long ago. I grin wickedly. Perfect for baiting some traps. I pack up the axes, dynamite, and all the wire I can salvage. 
As an afterthought, I grab an empty glass bottle too, the neck still jagged where it was broken. Luring this beast will take every weapon and dirty trick I've got. For you, Dad, I whisper as I shoulder the supplies, turning to follow the monster's path back into the trees. I spend the rest of the afternoon preparing for my confrontation with the creature that killed Dad. Using the hatchets and knives, I sharpen the edges of fallen saplings into spears and posts. These I drive into the earth in a tight cluster, then strategically drape the area with foliage to disguise it as a punji trap. Nearby, I assemble a deadfall trap with heavy logs propped precariously over a tripwire. Camouflaged pits lined with stakes surround the clearing where I assembled my traps. Each one I bait with chunks of elk meat left to attract the creature with scent. No matter where it enters this area, it'll meet an unpleasant surprise. Now to set the final lure. I puncture small holes in the glass bottle's sides, then stuff the old TNT sticks inside, feeling the destructive power in my hands. This will make a hell of a diversionary explosion when I need it. I find a high rocky ledge overlooking the network of traps and wire the bottleneck with a long fuse I can light from cover and safety. As the sky reddens with sunset, I finish assembling my ambush and then retreat a good distance to my hidden overlook. Soon the crickets and nighthawks begin their dusk songs. My heart pounds with adrenaline, eager for the fight ahead. That monster deserves a slow, agonizing end for what it did. As night falls, I sit sharpening my blades, ready to avenge Dad. That night, I'm awoken by a trap snapping shut on something. I must have dozed off for a bit despite the adrenaline, because the next thing I know, I'm jerking awake to the sound of crunching branches and squealing echoing up from the forest below. I blink the grogginess away and spot a dark shape thrashing in my punji pit below, the sapling spears digging into it. Yes, my trap worked. I light my makeshift explosives fuse from the ledge, then scramble down an access trail I left myself. The twisted cries coming from the pit are awful, but welcome. As I reach the edge, I bear witness to the horror trapped below. A massive grizzly is impaled at all angles by the spears, tearing itself into worse wounds trying to break free. Dark blood mats its fur as its roars turn to pathetic whimpers. I leave the dying grizzly caught in my trap. It's not the creature I'm hunting. As I creep back through the moonlit woods, I hold my makeshift torch aloft, casting flickering light and shadow across the trees. My feet avoid dry twigs as I approach the area I left baited and rigged. Is the predator here stalking its prey? My heart pounds so loud I can barely hear the stealthy steps tracking me in return. I wheel around frequently, brandishing my torch and knife against the darkened forest. But always, nothing is there, until the hairs on my neck stand up, sensing the eyes upon me once more. Something smart and deadly is toying with me, keeping its distance. But it won't for long. I just need to draw it fully into my web. When I reach the bait pile left untouched, I realize my plan has failed. That beast didn't take my offering and now knows to avoid this area. Cursing under my breath, I creep back toward my distant camp, defeated for tonight, but not broken. Just as the flame dies, two glowing eyes appear inches from my face. My torch winks out just as I emerge into a moonlit clearing halfway back to camp. I pause, struggling to see in the pale moonlight. As my vision adjusts, I detect a shift in the darkness. Two small orbs seem to float at the tree line, reflecting the weak light unnaturally. I stare, trying to make sense of this phenomenon. Then it hits me. Those are eyes. I back up slowly, every sense screaming danger. The eyes advance from the shadows, low to the ground and blazing red with a malevolent intelligence no beast possesses. A massive shape begins taking form, easily nine feet tall and as broad as a bear. An awful animal odor overtakes the scene, issuing from matted fur covering impossibly large limbs and torso. 
I spot jagged claws and teeth glinting in the moonlight as the creature steps fully into view. Every instinct in me shrieks to run, but I stand frozen in primal terror. This is the predator that took Dad from our camp, I'm sure of it. But nothing could have prepared me for something so huge, so monstrous. I should flee into the night, yet I'm paralyzed by those devilish glowing eyes piercing my soul. Death has tracked me down to play its wicked games for a while, and I know I'm utterly, hopelessly outmatched here in this dark forest. The towering beast is upon me in an instant, moving with shocking speed for its size. Its massive hand clamps down on my shoulder, talons digging painfully into my flesh. I'm lifted off my feet like a rag doll and flung backwards with tremendous force. My back and head crack against the unyielding tree trunk, exploding my vision into a shower of sparks. As I slump to the ground, clinging to consciousness by a shred, I watch helplessly as the blurred shape of the creature looms over me. I try to scramble away on all fours, but my limbs have turned to jelly. The blow to my head clouds everything in a dizzy haze. The monster reaches down and seizes me by the shirt collar, yanking me up like I weigh nothing. Fetid breath blasts my face as it roars triumphantly, making my ears ring. Those glowing red eyes bore into mine with primal hunger and hate as its jaws open wide, revealing rows of jagged teeth. This is it. I'm monster food. As the beast pulls me towards its salivating maw, razor-sharp claws poised to tear me apart, my senses finally collapse into blackness. Everything goes numb and I'm swallowed up by the void. Cold, damp, and stale air is the first sensation as I regain consciousness. It fills my nostrils and mouth with its tomb-like essence. My throbbing head pulses in time to my heartbeat as I force my leaden eyelids open. Inky darkness presses in from all sides. I try to blink away the blackness, but it stubbornly remains. Where am I? As the feeling slowly returns to my limbs, I shift slightly and hear the rattle of chains. The icy bite of metal encircles my left ankle. I'm shackled in this lightless place, wherever it may be. Fear ripples through me as blurred memories return of being ambushed by that beast and thrown against a tree with terrific force. It must have dragged me to its lair while I was out cold. But where? And why am I still alive? I sweep my hands over the cold, damp floor around me. My fingers encounter smooth, rounded objects that seem to be bones. Human bones from the size. Lots of them. Skulls, ribs, femurs. My breath quickens. Oh God, this is a mass grave. I recoil in fresh horror, only to brush against another mound of remains behind me. I'm completely surrounded by a grisly trove of gnawed skeletons. Full panic sets in then. I lurch against the chain manacling my leg, but it only bites deeper. Help! I scream into the silent darkness. Get me out of here! But my pleas go unanswered, echoing down unknown corridors. Rocking back and forth, I close my eyes and pray this is just a nightmare I'll wake from soon. But nightmares don't generally come with pain, and the throbbing in my head reminds me this is all too real. Time loses all meaning in this place. Has it been hours or days since I awoke chained in this tomb? Starvation and thirst are setting in, bringing constant headaches and dizziness. When my end will come in this hellhole, I don't know. But then I hear something shuffling in the dark, clawed feet dragging a heavy object across the stone. My blood turns to ice. I press against the cave wall, willing myself invisible as the shambling footsteps draw closer, accompanied by the skittering of loose pebbles. I hold my breath, heart jackhammering against my ribs. A guttural snort echoes from just yards away as I finally detect the outline of my monstrous captor emerging from the blackness. It drags the carcass of a massive elk, leaving a trail of blood. By the meager light reflecting in its eyes, I watch the hulking beast settle beside its fresh kill and tear ravenously into the elk's belly with savage fangs and claws. Strings of gore spray the cave floor as it feasts. 
Hot, metallic-scented blood splashes my face and arms, mixing with the cold sweat of terror. The gruesome sight makes my mind reel. I should be dead like this elk. Why has the beast kept me alive if not to toy sadistically with me first? Eyes squeezed shut, I silently pray for courage I don't possess, or the mercy of a quick death. I study it, looking for any weakness I can exploit for escape. The sounds of the feast drag on for what seems like an eternity, bones cracking, meat tearing, the monster's guttural grunts of satisfaction. I don't dare open my eyes again until the sounds taper off. A heavy thump tells me the beast has flung aside what remains of its meal. I risk a tiny glance and see it sprawled on its side in a stupor, bulging stomach exposed. Now may be my only chance. Hardly daring to breathe, I observe every inch of the creature from the relative safety of the shadows. Even sitting, it looms enormous, at least nine feet tall, probably over 500 pounds. Matted, wiry fur covers its ape-like frame. The head is the most monstrous part. Flat nose, jutting brow, mouth full of jagged fangs capable of crushing bone. Overall, it looks like the warped offspring of a prehistoric man and bear. My search finds no obvious physical weakness. Its proportions appear thickly muscled and powerful throughout. I glance anxiously at my chained ankle. The only way to escape seems to be unlocking this or slipping the foot out. But I'll need a plan for when it wakes. For now, I'll keep studying it for any opening to exploit, any small advantage that might change the odds from impossible to merely suicidal. The creature has trudged off down one of the adjoining cavern tunnels, leaving me alone again. But there's no telling when it will return. Now's likely my only chance to attempt escape. I strain at the heavy shackle until veins bulge along my forehead, but the metal only cuts deeper into my raw, bleeding ankle. The chain remains anchored firmly to a metal spike driven deep in the rock. Desperate, I search the pile of bones surrounding me, looking for anything small and rigid to pick the lock. Finding a splintered femur, I jam it into the keyhole and work furiously. After minutes of probing and twisting, there's still no give. My frustration mounts as the femur fragment keeps snapping and crumbling in the lock. Spitting curses, I search for wire or a slim piece of metal among the victim's remains, maybe jewelry that could trip the mechanism. But I find nothing usable, only more fragments of broken bone. Defeated, I slam my fists against the unyielding cave floor until they're torn and bloodied. Rage brewing inside, I grab a rock and begin smashing it against the spike pinning my chain. But it's driven in at least six inches and barely budges against my weakened blows. Breath heaving, I collapse back against the wall. Glancing at the tunnel where the beast departed, my blood turns colder imagining it could return at any second. I've failed and my hope dims along with the chance of escape. As I despairingly examine my raw, ruined hands by touch in the pitch blackness, a faint noise in the distance makes my ears prick up. It almost sounded like... a voice. I hold my breath and listen intently until it comes again. A ragged cry of pain from somewhere far down one of the adjoining tunnels. Could it be Dad somehow alive and trapped here too? Dad? Is that you? I shout into the darkness, my voice breaking. No response, but after a moment another pained yell echoes back, weaker this time. It's unmistakably my father's voice. He must be shackled in a distant cavern, crying out in agony. The beast seems to be slowly torturing him for its own sick amusement. Just hold on, Dad. I'm going to get us out of here. I yelled desperately down the stone corridor. Hearing him suffering so nearby is too much to bear. I claw and pry with renewed frenzy at the spike pinning my chain, ignoring the hot blood now slicking both hands. That monster is hurting my dad. I have to get loose. Dad's hoarse screams go quiet again, leaving only deafening silence. 
Sobbing in anguish and fury, I keep tearing at the unbreakable bonds tethering me, heedless of broken nails and mangled fingers. I cry out promises of rescue, though he likely can't hear now. Holding on to hope is all I can do. I clawed desperately at the loose rocks and hard-packed earth around the metal spike, trying to dig it out. My broken and bloody fingernails leave deep gouges in the unyielding cave floor. But no matter how much grit I scrape away, the spike remains lodged fast in the rock. Exhausted and frantic, I chip away at the metal bolt itself with a sharp stone, hoping to weaken or snap it. But with my awkward angle and clumsy grip, I barely scratch the surface. All I accomplish is flaying the skin from my fingers and palms until they're shredded and oozing red. I ignore the searing pain and keep digging relentlessly. I have to get free before that beast returns. But by now, I'm dripping blood and gritty with sweat and grime. Still, the chains won't budge an inch. Anguish and frustration rise in my throat as I slump back, staring down at my ruined hands. Blood steadily drips from my mangled fingertips as the shackle continues to bite cruelly into my ankle. No amount of raw determination can overcome this obstacle. I'm still trapped in the monster's lair. Tears leak down my grimy cheeks as I face reality. There's no escaping this cave on my own. I'm helpless to save either of us. All my desperate efforts have only weakened me further. Lightheaded from pain and blood loss, I slump over awaiting death or worse. I'm so sorry, Dad. I must have blacked out again because the next thing I know, heavy footsteps are approaching and gravel scrapes beneath monstrous claws. I force my crusted eyes open to see two malevolent red orbs glowing in the blackness as the creature comes for me. It pauses just feet away, nostrils flaring as it smells my blood. I spot the deep furrows I clawed around the spike before passing out. The beast's eyes narrow and it lets out a rumbling snarl, bearing jagged fangs. I try to scramble away but I'm too weak, too woozy. The creature grabs me around the throat and heaves me up like a misbehaving pup. Hot, rank breath blasts my face and hairy paws crush my windpipe. Spots explode across my vision as I dangle and wheeze for air. Just when I feel consciousness slipping away, it hurls me back to the hard ground. As I lie gasping like a landed fish, it looms over me, claw raised threateningly. I know what's coming and close my eyes. Punishment doled out by this monster will be nothing compared to what my failure has likely already cost Dad. As the first brutal blows rain down, I retreat deep within my mind, seeking solace in memories far from this eternal night. Someday the pain will end. The beating seems to last forever, until I'm barely clinging to awareness. When it finally stops, I don't dare move. Each shallow breath sends fire through my ribs. Surely the monster has beaten me to within an inch of death this time. I'll never free Dad or myself now. Suddenly, I hear my father's screams echoing again, weaker than before. The sound reignites some primal protective fire in me. I have to try and save him, even if it means sacrificing myself. Mustering my last reserves of strength, I rasp out, Please, stop hurting him. Take me instead. The creature pauses, head cocked. Emboldened, I raise my voice louder. Let my father go. Take me in his place. I repeat this desperate plea over and over, ready to offer my life if this evil being can understand mercy. It stares down at me for an eternity, with no hint of emotion on its alien face. Then, moving deliberately, the beast reaches down, unlocks my shackle, and wrenches me up by the arm. Is it leading me to my execution? I stumble along weakly as it drags me towards Dad's screams, prepared to meet my fate if it will save him. The creature drags me stumbling through pitch-black tunnels, my head spinning with blood loss. But I don't resist, focused only on reaching Dad. We emerge into a small cavern, faintly lit by a crevice overhead. I see a hunched figure chained to the far wall. He raises his head slowly, as if believing I'm only a hallucination. 
I lurch forward despite the monster's grip and fall at Dad's feet. We cling together, both battered and broken, weeping tears of joy and grief. After a lifetime, I lean back to look at him in the dim light. His face is swollen and bloodied almost beyond recognition. I can only imagine how I must appear to him in turn. But nothing matters now, except that we're together again, against all odds. I was afraid I'd lost you, Dad says, voice cracking. Our relief is short-lived. The creature grabs me by the hair and clamps the shackle around my own ankle. I'm chained beside Dad, close enough to touch. But we remain trapped deep in the creature's lair. Chained beside my father in the cramped cavern, I feel the will to survive slowly leaving my battered body. But Dad grasps my hand fiercely in the darkness. Don't give up hope, he whispers. We're getting out of this hellhole. Whatever it takes, even if it's the last thing I do, I swear I'll get you home. His firm determination ignites my fading spirit like flint to steel. I manage a weak smile despite the direness of our plight. We'll get out together, I vow. I'm not leaving this cave without you. Studying our small prison, I notice a femur bone near Dad's chained foot, one of the many remains scattered about. But this bone is thicker than the rest, with a bulky rounded end welded onto it, probably from a woolly mammoth or giant elk. I point it out to Dad. He tests the heft and balance of the heavy bone club, then gives me a fierce grin. The first spark of hope lit in his eyes since we were reunited. It's not much, but it'll give that ugly bastard a wallop once we get the chance, he says. We work together to angle the club within his reach. Even chained, Dad should be able to swing it with brutal force when needed. We quietly celebrate this tiny advantage with our first drink of water as captives, rationing the murky drops that drip from the ceiling. It tastes sweet, quenching our parched throats. We don't have to wait long before heavy footsteps shake the tunnel floor, announcing the creature's return. I exchange a meaningful look with Dad, it's time. I belly crawl to the edge of the light's perimeter, fortifying my nerves. Dad wraps both hands around the mammoth bone, poised to strike. As the glowing red eyes emerge from the darkness, I throw a loose stone, striking its torso. The Sasquatch snarls, turning my way. I desperately scramble back, but its focus holds on me just long enough. With an enraged cry, Dad leaps up and swings the club with all his might. It connects solidly with the beast's left knee in a spray of dark blood. The leg buckles sideways with a sickening crunch. The monster's head whips toward Dad, club raised for another blow. But quicker than seems possible, the Sasquatch slams him against the wall in a chokehold. My dad's face purples as his chained legs flail desperately. I scream and clutch at the monstrous hand, trying fruitlessly to free him. It glares at me with those malevolent red eyes and tightens its grip around Dad's throat. Just as black spots swarm my vision, there's a whistling sound and a wet thunk. The creature's snarling face goes slack and the hand drops Dad. He crumples, gasping for breath. Behind the dazed monster, the mammoth bone club clatters to the ground. Somehow, Dad must have struck its injured knee again, sending them both toppling. And on the way down, he smashed the monster's skull with the club, crushing bone. It sways, dark blood sheeting from its deformed head. Those demonic eyes roll back. With a loud thud, it hits the ground. Dad staggers over. Grabbing the blood-coated club, he begins savagely bashing the creature's head and neck, reducing both to a pulpy ruin. I want to look away from the gruesome scene, but can't. We're both running on instinct now, survive at any cost. When only mangled meat remains above its shoulders, Dad finally stops, breathing hard. The thing that haunted our nightmares now looks pitiful, a pile of matted fur and bones. We cut its reign of terror short in this dark cave forever. 
and yet our desperation remains. I can't tear my eyes from the sight as Dad brings the club down with crushing force on the beast's skull. There's a sick, splintering sound on impact. Its legs buckle, and the Sasquatch topples like a felled redwood, hitting the stone floor hard enough to shake dust from the ceiling. For a moment it lies there, a dark, spreading puddle haloing its head. I hold my breath, terrified that any second it will rise up and resume its attack with renewed fury. But the massive body remains sprawled and motionless, aside from a few awful twitches running through the limbs. Dad prods its arm warily with the bone club, poised to strike again. There's no response. He turns and gives me a fierce, relieved smile through the blood and grime coating his face. I crawl over to join him, hardly able to believe our luck. Dad crushed the monster's skull with that mammoth bone, using only adrenaline and desperate strength. Help me search it quick before it wakes up, Dad says, rifling through the hide. We frantically comb through its fur for anything that could possibly free us from these shackles and cave. Just when hope is fading, Dad says, Aha! He holds up a small metal pick triumphantly. I recognize it as a miner's tool for cleaning and scraping ore deposits. It just might work. Dad kneels by my chained ankle and carefully inserts the pick into the lock, delicately maneuvering the pins inside. The seconds crawl by agonizingly. I glance anxiously between his focused face and the Sasquatch's motionless body just feet away. Finally, I hear the glorious click of the tumblers aligning. The iron cuff springs open. My raw, chafed ankle is finally free after days of brutal confinement. I could cry from the relief. Dad makes short work of his own lock, too, and helps me to my feet. The tunnel twists and rises, and eventually, fresh air kisses my face. With a final burst, we scramble up the rocky passage on hands and knees toward that beautiful light. Together, Dad and I burst out into the open forest, gulping the free air hungrily. But we don't stop running, knowing the nightmare is right on our heels. It's been days, maybe weeks in that lightless underworld. Emerging battered and bedraggled, time and direction lose meaning. Dad and I slowly pick our way along the riverbank, struggling to stay upright with each agonizing step. When the terrain gets too steep, we claw up slopes on all fours like animals. Mile after mile we press on, trading weak encouragement or leaning to rest in silence. The pristine river soon grows choked with outstretched roots from shoreline spruce that provide welcome handholds. An ancient bear trail marked by claw marks appears along the bank, which we gratefully follow out of the craggy canyon into gentler forest foothills. Dad's energy surges when we spot a crumbling cabin nestled ahead by the river's edge. But it's abandoned, offering only a brief break from the elements. Replenishing our strength as best we can, we set forth again downriver, now following trails that show signs of man. I smile for the first time in weeks when familiar smoke trails appear above the trees ahead. Our camp. Somehow we found our way back. It's been over 40 years now since that fateful Alaskan camping trip with my dad. But even today, hardly a day goes by that I don't think back to the summer of 72 and what we endured out there in the unforgiving wilderness. It fundamentally changed both of us. After finally limping back to our campsite, more dead than alive, we managed to contact a bush pilot to come retrieve us within a couple of days. I'll never forget the look on that pilot's face when he landed on the gravel bar and saw two bloodied, dirt-caked skeletons emerge from the forest. I don't think he believed our delirious tales of a towering man-beast deep in those woods that hunted men for sport. He chalked it up to a bear attack and hypothermia-induced hallucinations. But Dad and I knew the truth. We spent two months as playthings trapped in that lightless cave by a creature whose evil surpassed any natural animal. No one could understand what we endured. How close we came to adding to the human remains littering its lair, if not for our final escape.
That summer instilled a wariness of the darkness I've never fully shaken. To this day, I still sleep with a nightlight because of the vivid memories of that lightless cave. Claustrophobia kept me from ever scuba diving or spelunking with friends. And the paranoia of being watched from the woods persisted into my twenties until I finally sought counseling. But the experience also left me resilient to life's everyday struggles. After staring down a living nightmare like I did at 15, most problems seem trivial in comparison. I truly believe surviving that prepared me for emotional hardships to come, like grieving Dad's death from cancer last winter. He was my anchor, the man who taught me unimaginable courage in the face of darkness. Not a day goes by that I don't miss him. At 60 now, my daily routine is tame compared to my former life. I'm quite content puttering around the house and tending my garden these days. But some wild part of my spirit will always remain 15, crouched by a flickering campfire deep in those Alaskan woods, ready to battle monsters. Because I know now such evil does lurk in forgotten places, 